I'm going to call to order the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Sea Power and Projection Forces. I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. And we're here to discuss the 355 ship Navy and options that Congress may consider to deliver the required fleet. Appearing before us today to discuss this important topic are three esteemed Navy witnesses Honorable James Gertz, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Research, Development, and Acquisition, Vice Admiral William R. Mers, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems and Vice Admiral Tom Moore, Commander, Naval Sea Systems Command. I want to thank you all for your service as well as for appearing before the subcommittee today to discuss the Navy's fleet requirements and various options for Congress to pursue to meet the Navy's needs. In previous hearings, I've expressed my concern as to the 30-year shipbuilding plan's inability to reach the required 355 ship Navy. The Navy's plan only reaches 342 ships by 2039. Critical shortfalls in aircraft carriers, large deck amphibs, and attack submarines will severely challenge future Navy operations. And I'm particularly troubled by the administration officials who advocate as to obtaining the required 355 ship Navy without consideration of other concerns expressed by this subcommittee. The 355 ship Navy is more than just a slogan. It is a requirement that was carefully considered by the Navy enacted by Congress and signed into law by the Commander-in-Chief. We need both quality and quantity to be successful in dissuading potential aggressors. As to this hearing today, I look forward to our panel discussing options that Congress may consider to fulfill our constitutional duty to provide and maintain the Navy. I think Congress has a multitude of options that could be pursued to limit Navy shortfalls and change the trajectory of our Navy's fleet. These options include expanding the Navy by building our way to meet the requirement, but I also believe that the Navy could pursue other options to improve maintenance as well as modernize and extend the fleet in service today. As to aircraft carriers, I believe that it's imperative that we rapidly obtain the required 12 aircraft carriers and pursue a two-ship block procurement that has the potential to save more than $2.5 billion. Furthermore, we need to examine options to extend the current fleet which should include a careful examination of the service life available with Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Finally, I am particularly concerned about administrative limitations associated with the Department's intent to shock trial CVN-78. I understand that such a decision will delay the introduction of the USS Ford by nine months and delay significant learning that can only occur while this ship is underway. I'm also concerned about the submarine force structure, we currently have 51 attack submarines and are on a rapid path to reduce this force structure to 42 submarines by 2028. This is the exact opposite direction to meeting the fleet requirement of 66 submarines. Fortunately, we have several options to alleviate this reduction, and I support an innovative effort by the Navy and Naval reactors to extend the service life of five Los Angeles-class attack submarines and using existing unused reactor cores. I'm also supportive of adding new construction submarines in accordance with the Virginia-class multi-year procurement authorized in fiscal year 2018 NDAA. With regards to our large surface combatants, this committee was instrumental in reversing a prior Navy course to decommission half of our existing cruisers. I'm glad that we've been able to turn the tide on this budget proposal, but there is more work to be done. Many of our older destroyers have not been adequately modernized. The lack of budget authority has stranded many Flight 1 and Flight 2 destroyers and imperil our ability to meet their required service life. While the Navy has done a very good job in preparing a plan for the service life extensions of cruisers, amphibs, and submarines, I think that we need to provide significant emphasis on the modernization of the older destroyer fleet. Finally, our auxiliary fleet is in need of serious upgrades, and I don't think anyone would agree that a 42-year-old surge lift sea fleet is sufficient. Army indicated that they face an unacceptable risk in forced production beginning in 2024 because of the deficient surge sea lift fleet. The Navy's recapitalization proposal does not meet the Army timelines as a classic military service gap issue. We need to close this seam. As this is our last hearing before the NDA markup, I think it's appropriate to consider the words of our first president and in the conversations with Marquis de Lafayette, at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, George Washington was attributed to saying, without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. Our forefathers knew the power attributed to a standing navy, 
as we prepare for the testimony of this esteemed panel, I hope that we can remember the importance of our naval forces, their deterrent value, a deterrent value to war. I would now like to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Courtney. Thank him for his leadership, and Joe, for your remarks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Chairman, and, um, and thank you to our witnesses for once again uh, coming over to testify before the, the subcommittee to discuss the future of the Navy's size and force structure. In 2016, the Department of the Navy produced a new force structure assessment which determined that the Navy our nation needs is a 355-ship Navy up from the prior 2014 FSA that set a target of 308 ships. This is not a number that the Navy came to simply because it believed it needed a larger force. It reviewed and validated the stated requirements and the real-world demands faced by our combatant commanders, and it looks to present challenges and those expected in the decades ahead. Unfortunately, as the chairman said, uh, the administration's last two budget requests have fallen short to achieve of a, uh, a plan to achieve the goal of attaining the 355-ship level uh, in a strategically meaningful amount of time. The latest long-term shipbuilding plans do not achieve that level at any time in the next three decades and likely will not under current estimates until the 2050s. The good news is, is that the Navy itself has made clear in the new shipbuilding plan that there is room to grow our investments in ships and submarines above and beyond the plan laid out in the 2019 budget. Our subcommittee last year worked hard on a bipartisan basis to produce a defense bill that adding new ships provided strong multi-year authorizations that made clear that achieving a 355 ship Navy is the law of the land and um, feasible within a shorter time frame. All three of our witnesses have been before our panel in public testimony and private meetings regularly over the last few weeks and months. I hope that you've all come away from these sessions with a good understanding of how our subcommittee works well together to produce a solid bill in support of shipbuilding and our at-sea capabilities. Above all, I hope you've gotten the message loud and clear that we're ready to move ahead in a constructive way to do all we can to achieve the 355-ship Navy. What we need from you as we begin our work in the 2019 defense bill is a commitment to work with us to utilize all the tools that we have available here in Congress and in the Navy to get to that, to, to get to that target. At the same time, I think we all understand that achieving this higher force is not going to happen overnight, nor is it something that we can simply build our way into in the next five or ten years. We need a comprehensive approach that includes not only building new ships, but making sure that we maximize the capability and availability of our existing fleet. A ship in extended uh, dry dock, or worse, sitting pierside waiting to be dry docked, is of no use to our combatant commanders and only puts more strain on an overstretched fleet. I've shared with our witnesses my ongoing concern about continued delays and shortfalls in maintaining our ships, particularly with our attack submarine fleet. I've seen promising testimony from the Navy this year about the recognition of the need for a more comprehensive approach that leverages available capacity in both our public and private shipyards. However, we have more work ahead to ensure that we're moving forward in the smartest way possible, and I look forward to discussing this issue further with our witnesses today. Our job in Congress is to deliver the authority and resources. It's the Navy's job to execute those authorities and resources. I look forward to the discussion with our witnesses today to, to deliver the right mix of capabilities as we drive forward towards growing the fleet that the nation needs. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Joe. Thanks again for your leadership. I want to now turn to our panel, and uh, Assistant Secretary Gertz, I understand that you're going to be making the statement for the panel, so I will uh, turn the floor to you. Thank you, sir. Chairman Whitman, Ranking Member Courtney, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the Department of Navy's plans to deliver the right capabilities for the Navy's 355-ship plan. I'm joined here today by Vice Admiral Bill Mers, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems, and Vice Admiral Tom Moore, Commander of the Naval Sea Systems Command. With your permission, I intend to provide a brief opening remarks for the three of us and submit our statement for the record. Without objection. As detailed in the 2018 National Security Strategy and the 2018 National Defense Strategy, in order to retain and expand our competitive advantage, it's imperative we continuously adapt to the emerging security environment and do so with a sense of urgency. This requires the right balance of naval readiness, capability, and capacity, as well as budget stability and predictability. It requires a Navy of at least 355 ships. The FY18 Bipartisan Budget Act and the FY19 President's Budget Request chart a course to begin, beginning, begin building this larger, more capable battle force our nation needs. 
Strong congressional support in the 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act funded 14 ships in 2018, an increase of five ships, including the lead Flight 2 LPD-17 class amphibious ship. It also includes strong support for the critical industrial base, a key element of our national security. Thank you for that unwavering support. The 2019 budget request builds towards this larger and more capable force and reflects the continuous commitment to produce a 355 ship Navy. When compared to the 2018 budget request, 2018 adds 11 more ships over the FIDEP for a total of 54 ships with three additional ships in FY 2019, as well as advanced procurement for the Columbia SSBN. As stated up front in our FY19 shipbuilding plan, the Navy continues to aggressively pursue options to accelerate the achievement of a 355 ship Navy. Executing the ship construction profiles in the shipbuilding plan, coupled with extending the service life of the DDG 51 class and targeted surface extensions of up to five FSNs, this provides an achievable strategy to accelerate reaching our goal of 355 ships from the 2050s to the 2030s. As the service life analysis work continues across all classes of ships, you'll see adjustments to our timelines and subsequent shipbuilding plans. As we accelerate growing our Navy to meet the 355 ship Navy uh, requirement, we will also be working to ensure we deliver overall best mix of Naval capabilities to meet the national defense strategy, including focus on our logistics fleet and our hospital ships. We look forward to continuing to work closely with this subcommittee on the options and opportunities to achieve this Navy the nation needs and do so urgently and affordably. We thank you for the strong support of the committee uh, that's provided the Department of the Navy the opportunity uh, to deliver on our 355 ship requirement, and we look forward to answering your questions. Very good. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Mertz. Appreciate, uh, Gertz, excuse me, appreciate uh, all of your efforts and uh, both uh, Vice Admiral Mers and Vice Admiral Moore, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Let me, let me begin quickly, and then I want to go to my colleagues here, um, uh, to you, Vice Admiral Mers. In looking at the existing destroyer fleet and looking at the modernization plans, uh, it does appear as there's a significant gap in modernizing Flight 1 destroyers and Flight 2 destroyers. And there's significant gaps there. And it seems like a lot of those ships are not going to make it to their expected service life because we're, we are essentially front-loading much of the modernization on later generation Flight 2s and Flight 2As. And I understand that with upgrading radars and baseline nine improvements uh, through, through the Aegis programs. But I wanted to, to get your perspective on how do we take advantage of those existing ships to get the full service life expectations out of those ships, especially with a lot of the technology that's there today. Mr. Norcross and I had an opportunity to travel to the Aegis operational center there where they're bringing in some of the new radars to test up in, uh, in Morristown, New Jersey, as well as Lockheed, and we've had conversations with Raytheon. There's a lot of technology out there that seems to me that could be put into these Flight 1 destroyers and Flight 2 destroyers that would give us capability that extends well into the years, gets us more quickly to the 355 ship number, and really modernizes these systems as the Navy, Navy envisions this multi-ship platform, increased lethality uh, into the future battle space. So give me your perspective on how the Navy envisions that going in the future. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks for that question because it really does tee up uh, a little bit larger conversation on, on how we're approaching the DDG-51 class. So uh, you know, as promised and as stated in the shipbuilding plan, uh, you know, we saw a a path to accelerate this 355 achievement uh, as quickly as to the 2030s. And, and uh, recently, uh, NAVC completed the analysis of that class, so we will, in fact, be extending the entire class out to 45 years. And this gets directly to your question, um, okay, now what? Uh, what are we going to do with the, with the ships along the way? So there's, uh, there's a couple types of service life extensions. There's the individual whole platforms, right. uh, a little bit laborious, ship by ship, got to figure out how to do it, when to do it, and then kind of cram it into the plan. Now that part of it, let me, let me just jump in real quick. So that, that part of the plan is the, which, what the Navy terms HM&E, whole mechanical electrical on the upgrades there, aside from ship systems upgrades? It, it's typically both. Okay. Uh, we'll have to look okay. at the whole, the whole envelope of the ship, and that's how we go through that, that lens of, 
can we, should we, uh, the opportunity cost versus buying new, and, uh, and it's a pretty structured approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the much more productive and helpful extension is when we extend the entire class yeah. and do the, the terrific work of the NAVC engineers. Uh, we've come through that, um, I'd say pretty quickly. Unfortunately, it was not completed in time for the current shipbuilding plan, but it will certainly be reflected in subsequent plans. So with that, uh, now we know the life expectancy of the entire class, and then we can roll in the right maintenance and modernizations uh, much more efficiently, much more affordably for the entire duration of the class. Uh, the good news is I mean, there's no destroyer left behind under the old plan. Every destroyer will be modernized. Uh, and there's uh, two, we talk in terms of baselines, there's uh, three fundamental baselines the entire class will end up with. You'll either be 5.4, 9, or 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of them provide a ballistic missile defense capability, which is fundamentally the requirement we have to have. So whether that carries these through the life of the ship with the extension, uh, we have time to work through that on, on what it will take, and, and the threat will get a big vote in, in, in how we do that. Um, so how does this affect the 355 ship uh, number is it, it, it does, uh, as, you know, as, as we stated in the shipbuilding plan, uh, the 355 will now be arriving uh, in the, in the mid-30s. Uh, and that's only with the DDG extensions. That does not include uh, candidate options for three SSNs per year uh, or any other service life extensions in and around the, the time period. Uh, typically, the individual whole life extensions will only help you smooth the ramp. They don't really affect the overall number uh, in the end on when you achieve it. But a class-wide extension does, and that's, and that's what you're seeing. Um, so with the extension of that class, with the modernization efforts with that class, uh, we don't get the correct mix in the 2030s, but it's not a bad mix. If you have to have an extra ships, destroyers are good ones to have. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll work with Congress on how we manage that inventory because we don't want them to come at the expense of the new construction, especially uh, uh, the overall driver of the correct mix, which is the SSN. So we'll have to manage that, ma manage that very, very quickly. Uh, and right now, under the current plan, that's still at the 2048 timeline. But like I said, we have done uh, – that, that does not include any extra, any extra submarines in any particular years. And, of course, the, the, the CVN plan also is one of the, the lengthier ones. Yes, sir. So I have Very good. Thank you, Admiral Murrows. I'll know, now go to Mr. Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it looks like you guys made a little news already today by moving the needle from sure. 2050s to 2030s. So we're on a roll. You know, let's uh, – maybe we can keep going. Um, that's right. So, well, that's going to be my next question. Uh, uh, Secretary Gertz, um, you know, as, as I mentioned in the opening statement, you know, we um, in Congress want to help you by maximizing tools to boost shipbuilding. And in the last NDAA in the omnibus, we provided the Navy with authority to add more uh, submarines into the block contract that you're negotiating right now. Last year, uh, actually, um, Acting Assistant Secretary Stiller testified that the Navy, quote, has the ability in a multi-year contract to also ask for option pricing for additional ships. And then your, yourself in testimony last uh, month, um, when we asked about the most efficient way to procure um, extra submarines in fiscal year 22 and 23, stated that the most efficient way would uh, be able to try to get those into the multi-year. So I guess my question is, uh, you know, can you provide an update to the subcommittee on your efforts to, to take advantage of those options that um, Ms. Stiller and you, and you testified before the committee um, uh, over the last year or so? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd appreciate it. And, and as Admiral Moore said, uh, great news uh, working with Admiral Moore's team. Uh, getting 355 sooner, that doesn't alleviate the challenges we have on the submarine side, uh, but, but gives us uh, something to look at. So again, we're taking a two-fold approach. One is, uh, as we spoke about in the last hearing on submarines, looking at service size extension for about five SSNs, very targeted, that's a very specific hole uh, analysis. Um, and I th we think we're in a pretty good shape there. We'll prove it with the first one this year, and then that will give us a little benefit. And then the second is, where can we accelerate production should uh, that be affordable uh, and in the budget? Uh, we are looking at adding those two uh, submarines into the uh, pro contracting process. We're working through the mechanics of exactly how to do that. Uh, we've spoken with your staff of what that looks like in terms of uh, budget uh, impact, uh, and we're continuing to refine those numbers. Uh, so yes, I'm still committed to having options in those in that contract for additional submarines in 22 and 23, uh, should that be something we jointly uh, decide to do and, and can afford. 
Great. Well, as you said, our staff and, and your team are talking about ways that, with the mark, you know, we can help facilitate that because it, it is the smartest way to stretch dollars and, and get us uh, again closer to the to the target. Um, the um, and one other question, uh, you know, Admiral Moore, uh, in your written testimony in the Senate yesterday, which we actually do follow the House of Lords a little bit over here, um, you painted two different pictures for how the Navy manages private sector ship repair. Uh, when you discussed the non-nuclear fleet, you stated that the Navy is committed to working collaboratively with industry to provide them a stable and predictable workload in a competitive environment moving forward so that they can hire the workforce and make the investments necessary to maintain and modernize a growing non-nuclear fleet. But then when you discussed the nuclear fleet, you stated only that the Navy would consider private sector maintenance work during peak periods to ensure the health of the private sector nuclear um, base. I mean, you've heard me before, and, and you know we've had this discussion with Secretary Gertz. I mean, it seems that the 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 picture that you painted for the non-nuclear fleet about, you know, um, you know, again, maximizing speed in terms of getting the work done as well as leveling off workload, I mean, really does apply uh, for the nuclear side as well. And um, again, I just wonder if you could sort of, you know, describe the, whether I'm reading too much into, you know, there being a, a, a disparity there in terms of your um, approach or not. Uh, thanks for the question, Congressman. Now, I, maybe a reading a little bit into it. Um, you know, on the private sector side, for the non-nuclear ships, uh, it, it's all done by the private sector and it's in a competitive base. So I've got one, one sector I have to focus on. On the, on the nuclear industrial base, uh, I, have both the, in, in, I have both electric boat and nuclear new shipbuilding who have the capacity to do repair work in addition to the new construction. And then I have the naval shipyards. And so I have a responsibility also to maintain an organic capability to do nuclear repair. So my comments were really uh, we're relative to the fact that I, I have a responsibility to maintain both. I've got to maintain a strong, healthy industrial base on the nuclear repair base organically in the naval shipyards. That's by law. And, but I also have to provide, uh, recognize that it's also very important for us uh, to maintain the health of the overall nuclear industrial base at New Purdue Shipbuilding and Electric Boat. And so, you know, where we have fallen short in the past couple of years is we have uh, at the last second decided, hey, I don't have the capacity in the naval shipyards, and so here, could you do the submarine work for me? I think my comments were relative. We've got to get out in front of that. We've got to maintain a stable workload in the naval shipyards for very good reason, because they do they're the principal, uh, they do the principal work on both our carriers and our submarines. But we also have to factor in the fact that when I've got workload that I'm going to be challenged on, I need to give Electric Boat and Newport New Shipbuilding enough heads up so they can be successful as well. And if they have periods where they are significantly, uh, where they don't have a lot of work, uh, it would make sense for us uh, to, to make sure that we consider them in the, dis in the decisions on what we're gonna do for, in particular for submarine ma maintenance because it's, uh, you know, their health is important to us. It's, it's hard to expect them to be successful on the new construction side of the house if they're in this boom and bust cycle as well. So it, it really was, uh, meant to the fact that I've got to balance two uh, pieces on the nuclear repair side where on the industrial, on the uh, surface shop non-nuclear side, I'm really looking at one, one component. Well, I appreciate that. And again, as you know, we're, we're, we want to work with you on that. Um, you know, again, given the, the history with the SSN um, being sort of the poor cousin in the, in the, at the public yards, uh, you know, again, we think that there really is a sweet spot here where we can find a solution. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. We'll now go to Mr. Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Gertz, uh, Admiral Richardson had a white paper talking about carriers that if we bought them on a three or four year uh, cycle instead of five or more, that we could catch up on the, uh, on the 12 carrier issue, but yet the budget doesn't do that. And then also, can you talk to us about why that's the case? And then uh, on the block buy for the uh, CVN 80 and 81, we did that. It would save a couple, two and a half plus billion dollars. Uh, is that analysis on that savings uh, ripe and done? And uh, what are the plans on our trying to avoid the carrier gaps? Yes, sir. And, and obviously, carriers are a key component of our national security. We're watching those closely. On the timeline, you know, that can be an affordability issue of, of uh, you know, how quickly can we move those centers together and, and how do we balance that amongst all the other requirements? Admiral Mers may want to comment a little bit more. Uh, on that from a, an overall requirement standpoint. But yes, the, the, the number of years in those centers drives 
uh, our ability to get to the full FSA requirement in the, uh, for the CVNs. On the two carrier buy, uh, I think as we spoke in the uh, last, um, we are asking the shipyard to sharpen a pencil. We've asked them formally for the cost. Uh, in looking at you know all the technology available, all the new ways of building, and then what cost savings could we get by putting those two uh, ships together in a block buy? They're working on that uh, as we speak. We've already released a uh, a formal request for quotes, uh, and we should have that coming in the early summer. Uh, both their response and our analysis uh, of that response. It's not quite the same as when we did it in the Nimitz class because we've already started construction of CVN 80, so the savings are a little bit dependent on exactly when uh, should we go into such an agreement. Uh, that would occur, but uh, I believe there are substantial savings available. We'll get that refined down to a number we can go work uh, and uh, work with uh, the Congress to understand if that's something we jointly want to pursue further. So I'll have, bottom line, some better numbers uh, coming here in the next month, month and a half, and work closely with the committee on those and, and a way forward. Okay. On the, uh, I met with uh, General McDew on the Ready Reserve Fleet that's 40 plus years old. Um, any consideration to buying foreign ships and or used ships to uh, shorten or, you know, or shorten that life, you know, the, the overall life of the, uh, the Ready Reserve Fleet? Uh, yes, sir. I think there's a, a number of options that are available to us. Uh, some that you've, uh, you know, already authorized uh, for a small number. I think there's probably a, a larger number where we could buy uh, used, uh, could be foreign built, but U.S. flagships. Um, there's opportunities there, uh, and then there's opportunities uh, to accelerate uh, design of a new ship should we want to do a new construction. Uh, so I think there's a couple different levers we can pull. Uh, one is extend the ships we have till the end of their service life. Another is buy used uh, to give us some room, and then the third would be new construction, uh, potentially in a modular way where we're not, we can get shared uh, use of a common hull across many missions. Always makes me a little nervous when you decide to redesign a new ship for that's basically a commercial uh, vessel already. That uh, you know that the commercial side is trying to find out ways to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, better, quicker, fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I, 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 the, the, the new piece would be how do we take what's probably a common hull and okay. be able to use it in multiple missions. I got you. All right. Thank you for sharing your back. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. We'll now go to Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony today and thank you for your service to the country. Uh, Admiral Mertz, if I could start with you earlier this week at the Sea, Air, and Space uh, Exposition, you stated, uh, and I quote, uh, capability is where we would like to really, uh, we would really uh, like to put most of our energy, uh, and we can make, uh, as I quote, um, uh, make our fleet more lethal uh, much more quickly than just building uh, a capacity. So I agree with uh, enhancing our capabilities is critical, uh, but more capacity, of course, is also required to meet operational demand. So can you please describe how you think about the trade-offs uh, between adding capabilities quickly versus uh, building out the required capacity what's the what's the right mix uh, yes sir so the the um, the fundamental point of my comments was that balance uh, that, that you're alluding to uh, we've uh, we've essentially been surrendering the capability to keep whatever ships construction going that we could in the past um, we really need to do both uh, as we explain it if, if you just buy ships you you get what we call a linear improvement in capability. You're just buying more of the same uh, without a capability on top of it. Buying more ships and adding the advanced capability, you start getting a nonlinear improvement, and then if you start connecting those ships together, you can uh, maybe even get an exponential improvement. We can turn capability typically faster than we can turn uh, the size of the Navy. So uh, some of the advanced development efforts, uh, such as hypersonics, directed energy, unmanned vehicles, uh, you know, we think we have a pretty pretty aggressive and positive technology uh, vector to field this capability. Uh, and now we're just moving as, as, uh, as aggressively as we can to resource it, to, to bring it in as quickly as we can. Uh, I can do a lot more with the existing fleet using advanced capability than I can um, just by capacity alone. So that's, that's fundamentally what I, I was uh, referring to. That got interpreted that we're coming off the 355. Clearly, as we're excelling, is accelerating 355 to the, the 30s now. Uh, we are laser focused on that number, and uh, if anything, that number will probably grow in the future. 
So our, let me just follow up. Our competitors continue, obviously, to pursue advanced capabilities as well. So what advanced technologies or capabilities are you most interested in investing in today, uh, as well as over the long term to increase both survivability and uh, the lethality that you described? So, yes, sir, the, uh, actually the, the ones I, I just mentioned, the hypersonics and the directed energy, are probably the ones that have the most interest. Uh, there's also enabling technologies that we're partnering with industry. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is, is, is probably the most important. Um, and we also have the, uh, you know, the, our whole accelerated acquisition board of directors, which is chaired by Secretary Gertz and, and the Chief of Naval Operations that Shepherds identifies these technologies, and then we work closely with the committees to actually get them funded. I uh, turn it over to Secretary Gertz. He's got a he's got a few more on these. The only one I would add, and, and I remember Merch has been outspoken about this before, is is networking and network fires. So there's individual lethality on each of the ships, hypersonics, directed energy, some of those, and then there's how do we get the collective strength of the fleet by network fires and network enabled operations and whatnot. Uh, and so I, we look at capability growth in kind of both of those dimensions. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Admiral. So increasing the capability and capacity of our Navy obviously uh, will require uh, nurturing a more robust industrial base. And obviously this takes time as you, uh, you can't develop uh, journeymen, for example, uh, shipbuilders overnight. How are you currently working to support the development and growth of the industrial base? Uh, and is it sufficient to meet your specific requirements uh, for an increase in production today uh, in, in five years, in a decade, you know, as we look out in the, the hour years? Yes, sir, Congressman. I, I think there's, uh, you know, some interesting intersections of that. Technology actually in, in some of the um, shipyards is enabling us to more quickly uh, grow uh, experience uh, in, the, uh, in the industrial base. That's not a panacea. That's not going to fix things overnight. But that does help us where we have both a mature uh, workforce and then a growing workforce. Uh, and then the other piece is how do we try and get out of these boom and bust cycles so we don't train up an expert workforce to let them go, then then come back five years or ten years later and then try and train them up again. Uh, that is not a, that's not a cycle of success for us. Uh, and so, so then to, uh, to Representative Courtney's question, how do we then link in maintenance and availability as another enabler to help balance workforce, to preserve that workforce, how do we bring in new technology to that workforce to enable them to be more effective? Uh, both of those, I think, are opportunities for us to, to improve the way we've looked at this uh, versus how we've done it in the past. Very good. Uh, thank you all. My time's expired. I have a couple of other questions that I'll submit for the record, and if you could respond to those, I would appreciate it. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. We'll now go to Mr. Byrne. Good afternoon, gentlemen. For once, I'm not going to talk to you about LCS. I do want to talk to you about the follow-on frigate. And obviously, <laughs> moving on to more important things. Obviously, the concept there is the last 20 small surface combatants are going to be frigates. And uh, this is part of our distributed lethality concept. Uh, but unlike other navies, the frigate is not going to be our top line surface combatant. It's at the lower end. And so a part of that mix also is we've got the bigger ships that can have the greater lethality. This is at the lower end, so we get more of that distribution. So you got a trade-off there between what they can do, what you're going to put on them, and what they cost. So having said all of that, Mr. Gertz, what's the right target price for the new frigate? So, sir, our, our current target or, uh, you know, for the first one is on the order of $1.2 billion, and the follow-on $850 million is what we set. That was set prior to uh, our award of down selecting the five competitors. Uh, that dialogue is going on right now. That price may shift depending on what we get out of those studies. Shift up or down? Uh, that may shift. I would expect it to shift down both from the studies, and I would also expect it to shift down because of competition. Right. So I would not take the numbers as a given. That was as we set the program up, uh, where we kind of looked at kind of capability versus costs. That is going to be a trade off of capability versus cost. It's not a budget, uh, you know, we'll, it's, it's get the capability at any cost, uh, and we'll be better informed this year through those studies. That will result in our RFP for our, our final down select to the final target numbers. Well, the, the figure we had heard for a while, and I know things shift around, was 800. 
So obviously, if you can get through this competition, get that number down, that's important to us as we try to balance things out. So Admiral, with that in mind, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the, the piece here where you can move things around and perhaps get the lower price is the number of BLS cells. And my understanding is the Navy's looking at between 16 and 32. So being a, a simpleton, just look to me, you just strike down the middle and 24 BLS cells seems to be about the right number. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, yes, sir. The, well, I want as many as I can get. Um, I mean, the so remember, we have to take into take account cost. Yes, sir. Uh, so, um, you know, and the requirements RFP, uh, lethality is a piece of that. It's, gonna, it's a cost, it's a lethality, uh, and all those will compete to the, to the final selection. But do you have any thoughts about what the right number of BLS cells it would be? Uh, the right number is 32 or more, um, but we'll, uh, we're willing to have, have that as part of the trade space when we make the final, final selection. And when you, when you compare a frigate to a destroyer, which has over 100 cells, you can see the, you know, the mismatch we're trying to uh, balance here as we balance distributed lethality and mass lethality. And we have to bring both to the fight. And this is very fundamental to an away game Navy that we pretty much bring what we have. So how you bring it and how you distribute it is very much as important to uh, lethality per ship. Well, I just never forget the testimony we have from Admiral Harris about his early career in the Navy when he was looking at the Soviet Union's uh, corvettes. And they were much smaller ships that had not a very large number of missiles on them, but they, he had to be worried about every one of them. And I know that's part of what the Navy's thinking of. Let's have more platforms out there so our adversaries have to be worried about more, more of those platforms and what they're doing. So I just encourage you as we try to figure out how to pay for submarines and aircraft carriers and destroyers and amphibs and maybe a new type of cruiser. I just heard that today. Um, we've got to remember we can't spend too much on this lower end ship so that we're balanced everything out. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. We'll now go to Ms. Bordalia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our witnesses. I remain a strong advocate for the Navy to include the modernization and the growth of its fleet. And I cannot, however, in good conscience, watch the Navy grow irresponsibly without the backbone of critical ship repair and maintenance capabilities required to support the current fleet, let alone a larger one. So Assistant Secretary Gertz, last month, Vice Admiral Lesher, told this committee that the Navy needs to assertively get after a growing public shipyard nuclear maintenance capability or capacity. I also appreciated your personal commitment before this committee to ensure the Navy conducts a balanced report on ship repair capability in the Western Pacific. Notwithstanding the soon to be finalized report on depot level ship repair, can you please speak to how the Navy is planning for the increased depot level ship repair requirement that will go hand in hand with the modernization and the construction of a 355 ship Navy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, as you indicate, um, our Navy, naval power comes to me from three elements. That's capacity, that's capability, and that's readiness. Uh, and we've got to make sure we're looking at all three elements of those so that we don't rapidly build a fleet that we can't support uh, and can't support both in peacetime and war. And so we're looking at both elements that uh, Admiral Moore can talk specifically to the public yards and our growth plan there. But again, we have a 20 year uh, growth optimization plan to get those public yards in the shape that they need to be. Mm -hmm. We need to be looking at the private yards because that will likely be the next a real challenge for us in the next five to 10 years is availabilities grow. Do we have the capacity on the capability we need in our, public, in our private yard fleets to be able to take care of that? That's certainly an element we're looking at very closely. So you're satisfied then with the way it's going at this point? I, I think we have work to go, ma'am. I think we are getting our arms around our immediate, and so I am, I am more comfortable with our, that we've taken care of our immediate uh, and had less loss availability uh, then we had two, three years ago, thanks to the hard work of a lot of folks across the system. My eye is really in the future. Um, now that we've kind of caught up to today, how do we make sure as we build ships, we're building repair capacity, both in the distributed fashion and in the depth we need to be able to handle that so we don't build our way into a crisis five years or 10 years from now. Good. And that's where I think my focus will be 
Uh, and I don't know if everyone more wants to add a little bit more on the public yard. Yeah, thank, thank you, ma'am, for the question. So uh, the uh, naval shipyards right now, we've had a concerted effort over the last couple of years to grow the size. Uh, and we're ultimately, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll be at 36,100 personnel in the four naval shipyards. That's where we need to be from an end strength. That 36,100, it will be sufficient to maintain the, CV, the 71 nuclear-powered vessels we have today and eventually the 80 nuclear-powered vessels we would have as part of the 355-ship Navy. An important component of that, though, as the Secretary alluded to, is also to make the investments in the naval shipyards <laughs> themselves so that we can optimize the work going forward. So there, in addition to hiring the people, uh, we need to upgrade dry docks, uh, make sure they're available to support the future ships, CVN-78 and Block 5, Block 5 Virginia-class submarines, and we need to recapitalize the equipment in our shipyards, and then we really need to make a concerted effort to optimize the layout of the shipyards so that the workforce of the future can be more productive than they are today. And that, that gets to an earlier question about the workforce and and how do we yes. retain them. Thank you, Admiral. I have one quick question here, and it's for you. I understand that your number one priority for NAVC is the on-time delivery of ships and submarines. I admire your focus on the people and the talent management required to make this happen. Can you provide examples of how you intend to achieve that priority across a worldwide repair enterprise and how the strategic placement of ship repair facilities can help realize your number two command priority, a culture of affordability? Well, thank you for the question, ma'am. I, I would go back to some of what I just uh, talked about. So yes. I think uh, growing the capacity of the four naval shipyards to 36,100 uh, will achieve the first uh, uh, first point on time delivery of ships and submarine. And then it's absolutely critical that we get to the cultural affordability piece as well. And we've so we've got to not only do we have to deliver them on time, which by itself will start to drive cost down, then we've got to start driving the cost out as well. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to provide an industrial repair base across the globe, 21st century naval shipyards that have new technology new layouts, and is a place that we're going to be able to hire and retain the workforce of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I yield back my time. Thanks, Ms. Bordalia. I will now go to Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am quite pleased to hear uh, the talk about accelerating uh, the move to 355. I just would like to emphasize, uh, as we grow, I think we need to be making key investments in newer classes in addition to extending uh, service lives. And it sounds like you gentlemen have uh, have indicated a similar worldview today. And I appreciate, Admiral Merge, your clarifying point on your remarks from the conference earlier this week. And I, I you know, to paraphrase Mr. Byrne, I'm, I'm not going to ask about LCS. I'm just going to talk about small service combatants. Uh, but uh, I, I, th I do think we have a, a, an opportunity there. And we certainly have a lot of uh, outside analyses that are telling us about the importance of, of ships like this. Um, we've had the 2017 CSBA Fleet Architecture Study, which called for actually more than 70 small service combatants rather than uh, the Navy's current requirement for 52. So I just would ask if we wound up in a world in which Congress was providing additional small service combatants beyond the required 52, would the Navy be able to successfully employ them uh, in service com of combatant commander requirements, particularly just sort of as you look at the threats and the needs out there? Uh, yes, sir. That is actually a... Uh, very healthy discussion in the Pentagon, mm. um, and the uh, and the short answer is, uh, you know, certainly we can we can use all the ships. We are we are we are low to the uh, to our 355, um, but again, I always caution that that 355 is not uh, a number in isolation. It's a derived number, sure, uh, based on the numbers and the lethality of each class of ship. Add them up, and you get to 355. And, and you and I have, have spoken spoken about that. Um, you know the uh, um, that number I think is likely to you know change over time. I don't think it'll go down. Mm -hmm. uh, we just went through our series of studies to you know evaluate the components of the 355. Uh, there was variance in in those numbers. Uh, they all said we needed to grow, uh, and, and and the 355 was the most lethal mix uh, uh, to get there. The the real point of your question of can we can we operate them? Um, that, therein lies the challenge. Uh, mm. When we buy ships outside the battle force that don't make up the composite, uh, that puts a stress on the readiness uh, in place of the ships that we do need. So uh, 
if we choose to go down that route with Congress, uh, I would only ask that we continue that discussion with Congress sure. on the sustainability of those ships as they, as they come online, because they do have to be manned. Uh, you know, typically, we use a 70-30 split uh, for the lifetime cost of a ship. It's about 30% to procure, 70% to sustain it over the life of the ship. It's a little lower for the smaller ones because their lives are a little bit shorter, um, but the reality, there is a sustainment cost. And you can see in the shipbuilding plan, we are absolutely committed to the small service combatant. Yeah. Uh, we have, you know, we like to talk in terms of the chiclets. Those chiclets go all the way across the chart, uh, and, and there's a sustainment level that, uh, that indicates that we see no future where we will not include a small service combatant. On that point, too, and, and following up on Mr. Burns' line of questioning, I mean, obviously you're going to have to make difficult decisions and trade-offs between cost and capability, but without, you know, getting too far into a hypothetical. Would it be fair to say you wouldn't want us to do anything that would, how can I put this, uh, reduce the robustness of that competition, right? In other words, we all want a very open uh, competition among different designs that will come in at different levels of cost and capability. Um, obviously, we all have different opinions on what the, the selection should be, but would it be fair to say you wouldn't want us to do anything to sort of, you know, uh, preclude that competition. Yes, sir. I think it would be. It's fair to say that. Well, we all have a set of requirements. We've been transparent on those, uh, and then we will run a competition that's fair and equitable. Uh, the more we can keep that a fair and equitable one without um, trying to trying to intercede as we're working through that, uh, I think the better we'll all be. Yeah. And then is the Navy thinking through? I mean, obviously the plan is ultimately to down select. Um, and yet the SECNAV has stated on multiple occasions, you have all stated on multiple occasions, given the importance of maintaining a healthy industrial base, we don't want to see any yards closing. Uh, have you guys had the discussions about how to achieve that in a down-select environment? Yeah, sure. I think that's something we're going to continue to have to dialogue about. I mean, there's a lot of variables that go into play there, sure. but I think that's something where we've got to continue to work with you. It's a multivariant kind of equation, um, and it's something we need to look at, at closely. To include how do we uh, how do we work repair how do we work modernization uh, how do we look at the entirety of the requirement not solely just new construction and quite frankly not just solely U.S. domestic constru uh, construction. Sure. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. We'll now go to Mr. Garamendi. I'm going to uh, go to my favorite subject, which is make it in America. And uh, we've had discussions, increasing discussions, about the, uh, the sea lift capacity. And in doing that, uh, the question arises uh, from Transcom that, uh, oh my God, we've got to have ships right now. Uh, we've not yet seen the proof of that. Uh, but if that is the case, then they have determined the only solution is to buy a foreign ship and then bring it back and then repurpose it uh, here in the United States. Uh, if, in fact, that is the case, then if that's absolutely essential, and we have to have the ship sooner than you could build from start here in the United States, maybe we can work with that. But we must require that all of that um, repurposing, reconstruction, be done in an American shipyard uh, with American products. Uh, so just put that out there. The follow-on, uh, you mentioned the common hull. Uh, Makes sense. Uh, roll on, roll off, different configurations, all well and good. American built and American shipyards uh, with using the uh, national defense sea lift requirements. In other words, engines, anchors, all the rest of it, American made. Uh, many of the foreign engines, uh, for example, in the LSCs, are foreign-made engines with companies that actually could make those engines in the United States if we were to require that. So as we move forward with this, I want to make it clear that we're looking, at least for this person, and I think I'm in synchronization with the President's Make It in America program, that we actually do that. Um, so, and this brings us to the frigate. One of the uh, designs for the frigate is to use the uh, <coughs> Coast Guard National Defense, uh, excuse me, um, design, all well and good. However, that design was a foreign design and presently has 
foreign engines and a lot of foreign equipment in it. Not an acceptable transition from a Coast Guard national security cutter to a frigate. In other words, where is the Buy America provision in it? Again, the language in the National Sea Lift Defense Fund is restrictive. It is, pro, I should say, proscriptive uh, for American-based ships. So I want to just put that out there. It's something that uh, I'm not going to let go of this. I'm going to stay with it until we actually succeed. I do have problems with the uh, what the Coast Guard was able to do, and we're having discussions with them about their future <coughs> ships. So having said that, I think I've said what I needed to say. I'd like to have your response. Yeah, certainly, and sir. just tell me you agree totally and let us yeah. write it into law. Yeah, again, absolutely. Our industrial base, we've, we've talked about it, and this committee's been, um, been very uh, focused on it and for all the right reasons. Our American industrial base is an element of our national security. So as we did the frigate competition, as we've got it set up, you could use a foreign parent design, but it had to be built here in America, and, and I don't have any issue with uh, the premise that you know, where, where we've got American products, we can use them. That'll be something we focus on. Happy to continue to dialogue with you to get through all the different details, uh, both well, with the Ready I'm Reserve and future. pass the dialogue into writing law. Yes, sir. And then we can dialogue. Yes, sir. About how to get it done. The reality is that uh, the engines that are being uh, in some of these ships are made overseas, but the same company has a domestic manufacturing base. They just decided to do it overseas rather than to do it here. Uh, that is not an acceptable situation. And it's the engines, it's the compressors and the pumps and the electronic gear and on and on and on, not just the hull. I understand. There were some laws, you could just do the hull and everything else can be made somewhere else. Not acceptable. I understand. Enough said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. We'll now go to Dr. Abraham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarification, uh, Secretary Gertz, follow up on Mr. Gallin uh, Gallagher's question. I've listened to your testimony, read, read your testimony, and we've seen a couple of reports, and that's all they were, is that maybe that the Navy was not committed to the 355 number, that maybe 342, 343, but you're telling me we're committed to 355. Sir, we are committed to 355 at least. Good enough. One, one quick question. You were talking about the pencil sharpening, watching the cost, which is certainly what we ask you to do in your job. There's an issue right now with the F-35s, with the DOD maybe delaying some deliveries because there's a corrosion with the fasteners. Lockheed said, well, it's not our baby. DOD said it's not ours. Is there something in your documents, and I know I'm simplifying this on a very elemental basis because I understand the complexity of these uh, ships. But that says, like a warranty, first 12 years, anything breaks, you, you fix it? I mean, it seemed like it would save so much back and forth and save money. Yes, sir, and I'll, I'll answer that quickly and, and ask Admiral Moore if he wants to add some more of the details. So we, we do both warranty so there are pieces of the ship that were warranty components okay. and whatnot for set periods of time, depending on the contract. Uh, the other thing is we go through a very detailed, both builder's trials and acceptance trials, where builders, builder's trials, the builders got to prove the ship works and we write up uh, you know, anything that doesn't work. And then acceptance trials are where we formally test out the ship. And if there's something that isn't right or isn't working, then we've got those that we work off before we take formal acceptance of the ship. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, my concern is this, that even though you test all these things, it's man-made, something's gonna break eventually, and I just wanna make sure that something's in place, that we don't have this tit for tat, you know, who's gonna pay, who's gonna pay. It, it seems like that would be simple to take in the front side instead of worrying on the back side. All our contracts, okay. sir. Thank you, that's all I got, Mr. Chair. Very good, thank you, Dr. Abraham. We'll now go to Mr. McEachin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Gertz, I, I guess this question is for you, but you can pass it off if that's appropriate. Uh, to the extent that we reach a 355 ship battle for, force through service life extensions as opposed to new construction, 
are those ships going to have the full range of capabilities that planners assumed when they concluded that 355 ships would be sufficient to meet our needs? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start and, and ask either my, uh, my uh, compatriots here to jump in. So, so again, when we extend either through a service life extension or a class extension of a ship, that gives us some more time but doesn't necessarily uh, change the capability of the ship nor fix things for the long term. So again, as Admiral Murray said, when we do a class extension, that's good because then we can plan for every ship uh, in that. But that assumes we both maintain the ship and keep it modernized. Uh, I think as we look at the, the FSA uh, in the future, we'll look to make sure the capability we extend provides the capability we were looking for in that class requirement. Uh, and if not, then that would be factored into analysis. But Bill, I'll turn it to you. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, th again, that gets to uh, a lot of dynamics in the shipbuilding plan. Um, you know how we how we determine the rate of build uh, uh, to 355 when we combine all the classes together. We assume that we're already at 355, and then how many ships do we have to build per year to sustain that? So as long as you're below that number, that'll grow you over time. Uh, that was to ensure to we set the floor that we can no longer ever go below if we want to sustain a 355 ship navy. Uh, I give you that explanation because that's absolutely fundamental uh, as you bring in the service life extensions. Uh, the, the assumption is you are doing both. You, know, you cannot do one in, in place of the other or when the service lives tap out, you're gonna be in a worse spot than, than when you started. So it's a combined effort. Uh, we, we think we make that very clear. We're very committed to that uh, new construction plan. If we can accelerate to our goal using service life extensions, as we advertise in a plan, we had work to do on that. We've done that work. We've shown we are able to do it, but the premise is that we continue to build new underneath as the foundation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McKeach. And I go to Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, and the witnesses for being here today and addressing some of the questions. You know, how can we not talk about capacity at this point, except I don't have the base that I have to take care of. I have the entire world, so to speak, to take care of. Um, when we start talking about some of the conversation we had here today, critical industrial base, stable, predictable workforce and base, when we look at the way that we're trying to anticipate the capacity of our shipbuilding industry here in the United States. Many factors go into that. Uh, certainly you talked about the capacity, capabilities, and readiness can be talked about from the sense of what's being ready. You have the physical structures, the yards, the workforce, the experience of that, the suppliers' materials. Those are things that you normally would take into account. When you're trying to determine whether or not there's capacity in the future. Do you look at acquisition reform and some of the things we can do, the mistakes we made in the past, how do we make that better? Yeah, yes, sir, and, and again, I think it's incumbent that the we're always looking at that and that the solution to this isn't just more money or just doing more of the things we've always done. And so my job uh, within the Navy is to continue to drive affordability. Uh, some of that is through tool mechanisms like block buys, or multi-year programs as we're talking about doing in a carrier. Some of that is properly setting up incentives so we can work directly with the shipyards uh, to drive costs out of programs like you're seeing us drive costs out of the carrier program, some of these other programs. Uh, because ultimately my goal is how can I deliver the most for the dollar that the taxpayer puts towards this problem? And we've got to continually work on that. So another, another opportunity space I would say just, sir, is on the readiness side. How do we drive the cost to keep these ships ready and available uh, is another key component that we're going to focus on. So that combines the, when you're looking at are we going to make it in a reasonable amount of years. Technology, innovation drives that. But also supplier base. Mm -hmm. And there are many other uh, parts of the military that's going to the same but mm -hmm. or well for that. Do you take that into consideration? Uh, because they're building up just like we are in a different way, but the suppliers are common. Yes, sir, and I would say that, you know, the, the suppliers are the, the, the golden kind of uh, 
pivot point with which we're really going to get uh, speed and drive affordability down. I like um, to think it's the workforce that is that key because that's the one that takes so long to develop. Which brings me to one of the points. If you ever lost faith in America in this industrial base, go up to electric boat where we were. It gives you the faith that when we set our minds to it, we can do anything. The problem is trying to maintain that facility at a common pace that you're not going to lose that workforce or get taken by another. What mechanism do you have in place to continue that? We've tried to fit in some programs to keep a stable work base, but it's coming from somebody else's workforce. How do you address that? Sir, sure, a couple different areas. One is uh, like the 10 ship multi-year buy. So now that workforce knows they've got uh, both at Newport and at EB, they know they've got a, a, you know, a stable set of work coming through there. Another opportunity is looking at where we have common suppliers between Ford Class, Columbia, and Virginia, and treating those suppliers outside of just their individual program, looking at them as a supply base that's supporting all three. That's another area. Uh, and then again, how do we leverage technology to enable us to bring in, you know, a new, continually rejuvenate that workforce and get them trained up uh, as quickly as you can, especially where we're growing the workforce. Is there a number you put on it that we're going to increase capacity by 20%, 15.5? What number do you have right now? I, I would say it depends on which segment, uh, but you know, our biggest probably challenge area is going to be in the submarine force, specifically at EB with Columbia and us maintaining at least a two, year, two Virginias per year. That is probably the largest looming workforce uh, growth that we're going to see. But it kind of depends on each individual yard and program. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. Secretary Gertz, I wanted to get your viewpoint on hospital ships. You know, we talk about support ships, we talk about lift, uh, but I think looking at the future and what the Navy needs to do, those hospital ships are key, and we see what they do not only for our services, but also what it allows us to do during times of humanitarian need. And the Navy's plan to essentially do a service life extension on the comfort, I think, um, becomes more of a challenge than, than what I think this nation is willing to accept as far as the risk that it poses to us. Can you give us your perspective? Has the Navy re-looked at how they are going to recapitalize our hospital ships, and what do you think the future is for that capacity, which is, you know, maybe maybe not a direct strategic capacity, but I think it's a, it's a very very necessary support capacity for this Navy and a humanitarian capacity for this nation. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, and I'm, I'll turn it over to Admiral Merge on the requirements. How we're thinking about the requirement in the future. Uh, my first point was, you know, in the shipbuilding plan, we're showing one of those uh, ships right now doing, you know, without any other thing, will go away. We're not going to let that go away. So I, I want to assure the committee. There's no plan to erode any of the hospital ship uh, capacity we have. We are relooking, though, into the future. Is that adequate, and is there perhaps a different way to look at that? And again, hospital ship has different roles and different levels of care. And I, I pass to Admiral Merz a little bit to talk about how we're thinking of it from a requirement standpoint, and what's our look at that requirement for the future. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, you know, clearly how we handle our casualties has been a hallmark of the entire U.S. military, not, not specific to the Marines, Army, Navy, or, uh, or Air Force, or even the Coast Guard. Um, so we, we have made plans uh, to do a service life extension of both ships. That's a Roll 3 level capability. Those are floating hospitals. The problem with those ships is uh, there's only two of them, and they're big, and we're moving to a more distributed uh, maritime operation construct. So we have uh, recently commissioned a, what we call a requirements evaluation team to look at intra-theater missions. And there's a whole collection of missions that, that we're trying to get our arms around. One of them is um, a distributed uh, hospital capability. And, uh, and, the, and these, you know, these are going to be fairly challenging requirements. It's going to have to be able to support a V-22, for instance. So how do you manage the size of that and the speed and how it's going to go? So there's no lack of commitment. Matter of fact, uh, we're, we're taking a broader look at the capabilities on whether or not they are aligned with the way we plan to fight our, uh, uh, fight our future battles. 
So you're going to see that requirement probably surface here this year, and then we'll start the process on how we're going to fill that, fill that requirement. Thank you. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of discussion about, as you said, one large ship, multiple smaller ships, as you said, with um, capability of landing aircraft that could be bringing in uh, the wounded. Uh, have you all looked at some of the existing platforms, maybe something like um, JHSF or, uh, or um, Joint High Speed Vessel, JHSV, I should say, or EPF as it's termed now, Expeditionary Fast Transport, as, as a potential within that realm? So, uh, yes, sir, everything's a potential. Okay. So when, when, we, uh, when, when we levy the requirements on, actually, that's not even a good word, uh, because we're probably going to follow the, the model used with the frigate where industry was actually part of the requirements discussion, uh, which we think is um, already bearing fruit with uh, the, the spectrum of designs that we get to, to work through. So whether you know a uh, shipbuilder wants to attack these requirements from a new platform perspective or modifications to an existing, that's really up to them, okay. uh, and, and we'll compete that accordingly. Very good, thanks. Emma Moore, I wanted to uh, to pick your brain about how we address the drop in SSNs that's going to occur in 2029 down to 42. Obviously, we on the committee have addressed uh, going to three submarines per year starting in 2020. Uh, but that only brings us an additional three ships before we get into Virginia payload module construction. So we go then from 42 to 45, which, while good, is not the significant increase that we need. There has been a proposal laid out there to take five existing nuclear plants that are right now in reserve and putting them into Los Angeles-class submarines to give them a significant service life extension. Can you give us a perspective on where the Navy is with that? Is that just a concept? Is it at the point where you all are pursuing that? I know we've had some conversations with Admiral Caldwell from uh, Naval Reactors, but I wanted to get your perspective on how you see it uh, at NAVC and where you are in the process. Is it just a concept that's being floated? Are you pursuing this uh, as, as an operational effort. Uh, give us perspective on where things are. Yeah, thanks for the question, sir. No, we're, it, it's not just a concept. Uh, we're, we're, we're actively uh, pursuing that. Uh, I think it's in the budget. Uh, we've done the technical work on these five submarines uh, to allow us to get the additional service life out of them. Mm -hmm. Submarines prov prov pose a little bit more of a challenge in terms of a class extension because of the fact that they submerge and there are some technical issues associated with them we don't have on surface ships. So I don't know that we're going to get beyond the, uh, from, from a class extension standpoint, beyond the, about the 35 years that the mm -hmm. Virginia class and the, <clears throat> and the Los Angeles class are at today. We'll continue to look at this on a hall by hall. In this particular case, we had five additional cores yeah. available. It presented us with an opportunity to get some SSN accelerated back into the fleet. And so uh, between Naval Reactors and NAVC, we went, looked, found some hulls that we could sharpen our pencils on, and we're confident technically that they can get to the extended service life that we've, they've been asked to get to. Very good. Thank you. Secretary Gertz, I wanted to uh, follow up on a visit we had earlier in the week at Bath Iron Works. We talked to them about uh, the multi-year procurement for destroyers, and it seems like the Navy is still in the paradigm that they pursued with the previous acquisition and have not really followed up on the additional authorities that were given in the FY18 NDAA. And I wanted to get your perspective, because from what we're seeing is that the layout is a 10-ship purchase combination between HII and Bath, 5, 5, 6, 4, 4, 6, and all those different scenarios. And then the additional five that are authorized would essentially be one-offs. And we understand that when you do multi-ship procurement, I think it's everybody's intention, and certainly our intention, is to do the full 15 rather than 10 and then one off, because we think the 10 and one off actually adds additional cost. We know the greater certainty you have there, the better it is for the yards, and we all know the sand charts of, as you talked about, the roller coaster ride that they go through and the uncertainty it creates for both yards. So give me your perspective. Uh, is, there, is there any additional work that Navy's going to do in looking at the 15 authorization that we gave in last year's NDAA? and reflect that in the acquisition strategy? Uh, yes, sir, I would say, uh, you know, generically, the more you can put the requirements up front into the multi-year, the better. I would say this is unique because it's a competitive situation. And so to put options in 
that would just, if, if um, we're not careful, that would greatly, ex you, you could have so many different options, it would be hard to get a good competition. So we felt the best balance was uh, compete the 10 in the multi-year uh, and then put in priced options for those ships so that, that gives us some flexibility and then compete each of those as individual options. We felt that was the best balance to strike with the two since we were in a competitive you know, a kind of a rolling competitive uh, multi-year, a little bit different than say when we're doing a multi-year with a sole source provider. And so I would say that the uniquities of that competition drove a little bit different thinking than with the way we traditionally approached uh, adding more ships as a potential option in multi-year. Would that decision have anything to do with the different elements on the platform? I know we had talked about different radars, the upgraded AMDR, Spy 6 radar, and the things that go in with the design on Flight 2As versus Flight 3s. Is, is that is that any any element of that decision? No, sure, because these are all Flight 3s, so yes. they, they are all constant ships. And, okay. uh, and I think we'll, again, we've got a little unique situation trying to, to do this in a competitive uh, situation. But we'll look at it closely. We're getting feedback from the, from the shipbuilders, and we'll take lessons learned and, and, uh, and, and apply those as we look at future situations. Yeah, I just want to make sure we were firm in knowing that it's 15 Flight 3s. So very good. Thanks. Yes, sir. And I go Mr. Mr. Moulton. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, my questions are, are a bit more high level. Uh, just about how you came up with this requirement three, for a 355 ship Navy. Uh, we're fond of saying here in Congress that we're trying to go back to the Reagan days when that was the, uh, the number that was out there. Uh, that strikes me as an interesting comparison given that technology has changed quite a bit. So can you give me a, just a very quick insight into why that number makes sense? Uh, yes, sir. So there is a, there's a pretty rigorous process that we go through um, when, we, when we do a force structure assessment. Typically starts with the combatant commanders on what their needs are, and that is balanced against the war plans that they have to execute. Uh, and then we apply a broad range of risk factors, I meaning we can't f fight every place in the world at the same time, so we, we, we start sh shrinking it down to an acceptable risk level. Uh, and then we study it. Uh, in this particular case, there were three independent studies that went against the 355, and then uh, and then we red teamed it. And uh, and in the end, uh, that that is the number that held. Uh, there were other numbers in the mix. They were all right around that level. Um, but it's important to understand that the 355 is a derived number. Uh, we look at each type of ship, the lethality it needs to bring, the numbers it needs to bring. We add those all up, and that's how you get. So, how many in that analysis? How many autonomous ships do you calculate that we need? So, uh, so currently we do not count uh, autonomous ships against the ship count, uh, the 355 ships. But all the experts say that that's the kind of warfare that we'll be fighting in a few years. Sure. So, why would you not include those in the count? So we. We likely will in the future. We actually stayed in the shipbuilding plan that we're studying them closely. We do account for them in the sensors and weapons uh, arenas, but we do not count for them yet in ship counts. How soon do you think we'll have autonomous ships in our Navy? Uh, ship, well, there's a, there's a, um, there's autonomous some, ships, autonomous vehicles, exactly, whatever you want to exactly, call them. Yeah, you, uh, how soon you do you finished, think we'll you have? Finished my sense for That's yeah. exactly what I was uh, was moving towards. So how the, it really just depends on when we start fielding them. We have three you know, pretty solid candidates for the uh, autonomous surface fleet. We have, four fam we have a family of four different size on undersea vehicles. All these have still yet to be employed in the fleet. Matter of fact, we're, we're looking at moving the, uh, uh, the, the most mature surface vehicle from San Diego out to what we call the RIMPAC exercise this year to see how it how Would it you does. say the next five years, the next 10 years? I mean, my understanding is that China and Russia are every bit on par with us in terms of fielding these uh, types of vehicles or ships. Uh, so five to 10 years, I think, is definitely in the, in, in, in the target range of what we're what we're Right, with. so we're building a 355 ship Navy that doesn't include these autonomous ships which will be a, compo a clear component of our Navy warfighting machine in the next five to 10 years. It's not like these 355 ships have a five to 10 year lifespan. So to be clear, they're included in the Navy capability envelope. They're just not accountable 355 battle force ships. So you gotta remember, we have 355 battle force ships. 
We have 15 MSC ships. Uh, uh, we have our unmanned vehicles. We have a lot of ships that, are, that fall outside the accountable 355 battle force. Doesn't mean we're not interested. Doesn't mean we're not investing in them. It's just that they don't count against the numbers of lethality that, that we have set through our through that but process. But how can it not count against those numbers when they are going to be a clear component of our lethality? I think. The I mean, there's there a big is, difference it's, between. It's, it's, they're going to be. They're not yet. Okay. So, so the disconnect here to me is we're building a 355 ship navy today. Those 355 ships are going to last us long, much longer than the next five or ten years. I don't understand how you cannot account for these advantages, these advances in technology, which will necessarily replace some of these ships. It strikes me that it's like saying that, oh, you know, the Reagan years, the glory years in our defense, uh, we had X number of computers, so therefore we should have the same number of computers today. When we all know computers do vastly different jobs and we need vastly different numbers of computers to compete in today's world. Sir? If, 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 if I can interject here, actually the three studies that were done, the MITRE study, the CSBA study, and the Navy study included in-depth analysis of all these unmanned platforms. So the Navy plan and the 355 do include that as a total Navy force structure. So the element of what you count as a warship and what you count as an unmanned platform and how those are deployed from those other manned platforms is how you integrate that particular force. So we can make sure we get you a, a brief on these other three independent studies that went into length about how you integrate these unmanned systems into the existing force structure. And again, it's tangential to the 355 ship Navy. That's a support element of what would happen with these unmanned platforms. Mr. Chairman, I'd be very interested in seeing that. Yeah. Because my understanding is that China and Russia are not just looking at integrating these new technologies into their existing old-fashioned Navy, mm -hmm. but rather they're looking at the ability of these technologies to replace them, to make sure. them more lethal, well, and more we already, effective at lower cost. And we already have I'm one at sea right now. Sea Hunter right now is at sea. It's a surface ship. It's an unmanned surface ship. It's operating autonomously in the Pacific as we speak today. Well, and that's my point. This yeah. stuff is happening quickly. Yeah. So to be looking at, you know, our goal is to, is to, to have a, a Navy that looks like the 1980s when already our Navy is looking very different than that strikes me as a, uh, as, as a little bit of a disconnect in, in our research. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll make sure we get you that. I think there's some great information out there on how this is integrated. And I would ask, too, for uh, uh, Admiral Murs, if you would make sure, too, that we can get uh, Mr. Moulton a brief, because I think you'll be interested, especially the, the real details. We need to get you in the skiff and get the classified brief. There's a lot of uh, really good stuff that's going on out there. So, yes, sir. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and I mean, look, the, 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 the message I have not been at every classified brief, I've been at many of them. Yes. The message I have taken away from them is that this technology is advancing very, very rapidly. Yeah, it is. And in order to be com competitive with our peer, you know, our peer adversaries, we've got to be on the cutting edge of yeah. that. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it might take sacrificing the money that would go to a traditional ship in order to give us the capability yeah. uh, in the numbers required to compete in this new, uh, new battlefield. But I'd be very interested yeah. in these studies, and I, I appreciate your leadership, I think you, Mr. Chairman. And Rose, I think you wanted to add something. Uh, yes, sir. I was just going to follow up on that that uh, remark. We have, actually have significant investment across all the unmanned vehicles, and we're happy to um, uh, get, bring you a brief on, uh, on on all those capabilities that we're uh, we're bringing forward. Yeah. No, I appreciate it because I mean, ultimately, as with all of this, it's 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 a trade off. Yeah. I mean, I I was very very low tech military, you know, just just ground pounding in the infantry, uh, but it's like you know, just like we had to think about every piece of gear that we would have liked to have, you know, how much did it cost to, to get it, how much did it cost and wait to carry it. We had to be very careful about which pieces of gear we actually chose to, to get. Sure, I think we'll show you, we share your enthusiasm, uh, and, and even the infantry guys have unmanned systems now, so we're, uh, uh, we're moving out on it. I know, I know you share my enthusiasm. I also know that there's not a com combatant commander in history that when told he could have more ships or fewer ships would ever say fewer ships off the bat. But if really given the big budgetary picture, you know, might make a different decision. So thank you for this discussion. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Moulton. Appreciate it. Any further questions for the panel? Well, gentlemen, thanks again. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for your input and your thoughts. We'll make sure we continue this dialogue as we're on the path to 355-ship uh, Navy, which includes a very robust element of unmanned systems also. And uh, we appreciate uh, all that you provide to us, your thoughts, your guidance, and uh, the cooperation that it's going to take for us to get there as quickly as we can. With that, there are no further questions. We stand adjourned.